If you think that these beautiful beds, mahogany furniture, silk linen were for the beauty of those times, you are partly right, but all this beauty only saved a little from the terrible unsanitary conditions in medieval Europe, and about the Louvre, it is generally a horror. Medieval Europe reeked of sewage and the stench of decomposing bodies. The cities did not look at all like the clean Hollywood pavilions in which costume productions based on the novels of Alexandre Dumas were filmed. Swiss Patrick Suskind, known for meticulously reproducing the details of everyday life of the era he describes, is horrified by the stench of European cities of the late Middle Ages. Queen Isabella of Castile of Spain, late 15th century, admitted that she washed only twice in her life, at birth and on her wedding day. The daughter of one of the French kings died of lice. Pope Clement died of dysentery on the 5th. The Duke of Norfolk refused to bathe, allegedly out of religious beliefs, and his body was covered with ulcers. Then the servants waited until his lordship was drunk to death and barely washed him. In medieval Europe, clean, healthy teeth were considered a sign of low origin. Noble ladies were proud of their bad teeth. Representatives of the nobility, who naturally got healthy white teeth, were usually shy of them and tried to smile less often so as not to show their shame. The thing is that rich people could afford sugar and sweets, which were very expensive. This provoked the development of caries, which literally ate the teeth. Elizabeth Themis, the daughter of King Henry VIII of England, had such a problem. The young 25-year-old queen looked very young and was flawless. But the black teeth bothered her. Like many girls of that time, Elizabeth Thars, I tried to whiten her teeth but the substances included in such products had an aggressive effect on the enamel. Over time, the situation only worsened. The queen has found a way out in her favor. She introduced the fashion for black teeth and felt great. Teeth in the Middle Ages also hurt, and they had to be treated or pulled out. At first, the dentists were monks, as the most educated people. Then hairdressers began to engage in this profitable business. By the way, over time, they not only shaved and cut their hair, but also pulled out their teeth and did bloodletting. Plugging holes in teeth, as in our time, was not accepted. It was believed that they were gnawed out by worms, which were fought in barbaric ways. They were poured with hot wax or acid, cauterized with a red-hot iron. It was believed that pain could also be overcome in this way. Since medieval dentists did not even know about the existence of anesthesia, they anesthetized this procedure in an equally monstrous way. Either the patient heroically endured all the manipulations, or he was beaten on the head so that he lost consciousness for a while. But the rural poor had practically no such problems with their teeth. The peasants ate solid and raw food, and it made the teeth white and strong. However, there were practically no centenarians in the villages, and most of the population died before the age of 40. To help a person get rid of a particular disease, knowledge and experience are required. The doctors of the Middle Ages had only scant experience of ancient healing, but there was no serious theoretical basis supported by solid practice. Professional medicine has just begun to develop. At that time, this opinion of the church was dominant and sounded like this. A person receives all diseases and sufferings as payment for sins. Diseases were treated with healing icons and prayers. In most cases, this did not give any result, aggravating the condition or leading to death. Another thing were the village healers, whom the church considered representatives of evil spirits. Their skills were called witchcraft. Therefore, the church called for getting rid of such people by publicly burning them at the stake. But these healers treated ailments with herbs, proper nutrition, and physical activity. Louis XIV washed only twice in his life, and then on the advice of doctors. The washing horrified the monarch so much that he vowed never to take water treatments again. Russian ambassadors at his court wrote that their majesty stinks like a wild beast. Russians themselves were considered perverts throughout Europe for going to the bathhouse once a month, outrageously often. 
For a long time, there were jokes about a preserved note sent by King Henry of Navarre, who had a reputation as a philanderer, to his beloved Gabriel Destreux. Don't wash, honey. I'll be with you in three weeks. Detergents, like the very concept of personal hygiene, did not exist in Europe until the middle of the 19th century. The most typical street in a European city was 7,8 meters wide, such as, for example, the width of the highway leading to Notre Dame Cathedral. The small streets and alleys were much narrower, no more than two meters, and in many ancient cities there were streets a meter wide. One of the streets of ancient Brussels was called One Man Street. There, two people could not separate. The streets were washed and cleaned by the only janitor who existed at that time, rain, which, despite its sanitary function, was considered a punishment from the Lord. The rains washed away all the dirt from hidden places, and stormy streams of sewage poured through the streets, which sometimes formed real rivers. If cesspools were dug in rural areas, then in cities, people defecated in narrow alleys and courtyards, but the people themselves were not much cleaner than the city streets. Water baths insulate the body, but weaken it and dilate the pores. Consequently, they can cause illness and even death, said a 15th century medical treatise. In the Middle Ages, it was believed that polluted air could penetrate into cleansed pores. That is why public baths were abolished by the supreme decree. And if in the 15th and 16th centuries, rich townspeople washed at least once every six months, then in the 17th and 18th centuries, they stopped taking a bath altogether. However, sometimes they had to use it, but only for medicinal purposes. The procedure was carefully prepared and an enema was administered the day before. All hygiene measures were reduced to light rinsing of the hands and mouth, but not the entire face. You should never wash your face, doctors wrote in the 16th century, because catarrh or eyesight may worsen. As for the ladies, they were washed two to three times a year. Most of the aristocrats escaped from the dirt with the help of a perfumed cloth with which they wiped their bodies. It was recommended to moisten the armpits and groin with rose water. Men carried bags of aromatic herbs between their shirts and vests. The ladies used only scented powder. Medieval cleaners often changed underwear. It was believed that it absorbs all dirt and cleanses the body of it. However, the change of underwear was treated selectively. A clean starched shirt for every day was a privilege of wealthy people. That is why white collars and ruffled cuffs became fashionable, which testified to the wealth and cleanliness of their owners. The poor not only did not wash, but also did not wash their clothes. They did not have a change of linen. The cheapest coarse linen shirt cost the same as a cash cow. Christian preachers called for walking literally in rags and never washing, as this was a way to achieve spiritual purification. It was also impossible to wash because it was possible to wash off the holy water that he touched at baptism. As a result, people hadn't washed for years or didn't know water at all. Dirt and lice were considered special signs of holiness. The monks set a worthy example for other Christians in the service of God. Cleanliness was looked at with disgust. Lease were called God's pearls. Saints, both men and women, used to boast that the water never touched their feet, except when they had to ford rivers. People relieved themselves wherever they had to. For example, on the grand staircase of a palace or castle, the French royal court periodically moved from castle to castle due to the fact that there was literally nothing to breathe in the old one. There was not a single toilet in the Louvre, the palace of the French kings. They emptied themselves in the yard, on the stairs, on the balconies. In case of need, guests, courtiers, and kings either squatted on a wide windowsill near an open window, or night vases were brought to them, the contents of which were then poured out at the back doors of the palace. The same thing happened, for example, in Versailles, during the time of Louis XIV, whose life is well known thanks to the memoirs of the Duc de Saint-Simon.
There is a well, known story about how one day the Spanish ambassador arrived at the king and, entering his bedchamber, it was in the morning, got into an awkward situation. His eyes watered from royal amber grease. The ambassador politely asked to move the conversation to the park and ran out of the royal bedroom as if scalded. But in the park, where he hoped to get some fresh air, the hapless ambassador simply fainted from the stench. The bushes in the park served as a permanent latrine for all courtiers, and servants poured sewage into it. Toilet paper appeared only in the late 1800s, and until then, people used improvised means. The rich could afford the luxury of wiping themselves with strips of cloth. The poor used old rags, moss, and leaves. Flea control methods were passive, such as carding sticks. The nobility fights insects in their own way. During Louis the Frat's dinners at Versailles and the Louvre, there is a special servant to catch royal fleas. Wealthy ladies, in order not to breed a zoo, wear silk t-shirts, believing that a louse will not cling to silk because it is slippery. That's how silk underwear appeared. Fleas and lice really don't stick to silk. Beds, which are frames on chiseled legs, surrounded by a low lattice, and necessarily with a canopy, acquired great importance in the Middle Ages. Such widespread canopies served a completely utilitarian purpose, so that bedbugs and other cute insects would not fall from the ceiling. It is believed that mahogany furniture became so popular because there were no bedbugs on it.